When you need strength and wisdom, turn to God. He is the one who can answer our prayers. We are nothing and God is everything. When we need help, we need to reach to God for help because he truly does love us. God loves us so much he sent his only begotten son to lay down his life so that we may have eternal life. He has broken the chains we were held down by and through him is the only way to paradise. So trust in God, he is your best friend and creator. Praise his name daily. Amen. Salam al Masih to each and everyone out there. God bless y'all. Welcome to another live stream. I see DQS channel in the building. How you doing, man? God bless you. Throws out a big old hi, Chris. Hey, what up, DQS? And the rest of you as well. God bless y'all. Welcome to another live stream. And of course, uh, we will be muting Rumsey from Dawa over Dunya. He has uh, made some pretty bad YouTube short videos. Uh, there's more uh, that I will be getting to, but today I, I've got a list of a few. Uh, but before we get into that, though, we don't go too far without saying the prayers. So I pray to you, Father, in the name of your Son, and by the power of your Spirit, that you grant me the ability to speak clearly and boldly, to take captive any arguments against your Holy Scriptures. I also pray for the safety of the Christians being persecuted in Muslim lands, specifically people like Hatun Tash and our other brothers and sisters over at Speaker's Corner. I pray you take care and solve conflicts around the world. I also pray for our brothers and sisters fighting through mental health or physical problems. I also pray you reach down and heal them, Father. Dear God, you know us better than we know ourselves, and please give us the strength to keep striving for you. I'd also like to lift up some of your strong soldiers so that you may keep blessing them and their families. Sister Hatun Tash, daughter of Christ, and Brother Jay from the DCCI Ministries, Brother Adam Seeker, uh, the Biblicist, Debit Ray, Brother Prophet Google, Sheikh Umad, Gopal's Ministry to the Hindus, Brother Christian Prince, Rob Christian, Al Fadi, David Wood, Jay Smith, Sam Shimon, AK Sniper, Dr. Tony Costa, Steve Hussein, Reverend Anthony Roger, Brother Ask Truth Apologetics, Islam Critique, Lloyd DeJong, Somali Christian TV, uh, my good buddy Eric over at the Cross and the Crescent, uh, Bob the Builder, Sister Kay out of London, also my brother Thaddeus over at Reasoned Answers, Sister Chloe from Pro Life Chloe, my brother Avery at God Logic Apologetics, of course, brother Albie, and brother Paul that I had on here a couple of weeks ago, and of course, he's in here, uh, DQS channel as well, and any other uh, apologist or polemist not specifically mentioned here. I also ask God that you watch over the women giving birth this year and made their children love you, Lord. I also ask that you bring Muslims, Hebrew, Israelites, and any heretic back home to you. Lastly, I ask that through this stream today, just one comes to know the knowledge of the true triune God. I ask this in the name of your glorious Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I also want to get my thank yous out of the way. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank our Lord and Savior. Uh, without him providing me the ability to have an online ministry, uh, I definitely wouldn't be here at all. Uh, so I definitely thank my Lord and foremost. Uh, next, and, next off would be my wife and my children. Uh, God has blessed me with an amazing wife and some amazing children uh, that help with the ministry in every way that they can. And I'm just so blessed uh, each and every way possible. I want to thank uh, all of them as well for their support to the ministry. And last but not least, I want to thank each and every one of you out there because if I say it each week and I'm going to keep saying it again. If you guys weren't here, I'd be sitting here talking to myself and that just ain't any fun. So thank you so much for the community that we've been able to build here. And of course, the only support that I would ever ask from each and every one of you is just go ahead and fill up the comment section after the video is done. Uh, hit that like button, the subscribe button and turn on that bell for all notifications. 
and of course, if the Lord does place it upon your heart and you want to help the ministry financially, you can do that with the super chats, the super stickers, and or you can join up to the Patreon. Uh, the link for the Patreon is in the description. Now, lately, I've been talking about doing some online street ministry, and that will be coming up in the next week. Um, I was hoping to do it this weekend. I was hoping to make it up to Ottawa to be able to speak to Muslims at a tent. Uh, but the Lord had other plans, and I wasn't able to make it up this weekend. Uh, but my plan is to go up next weekend uh, to be able to speak with the Muslims. They have a tent out. Um, so I don't want to have too many people uh, hearing uh, Muslims lie about their religion without them being challenged. Uh, so I'm definitely going to try to get up there next weekend uh, so that I can get some video of that as well. And if anybody wants to help support that, you can definitely uh, join the uh, PayPal. That link is in the description. If you want to help to support the ministry, just uh, one-time payments, you can do that through the, pay, uh, the PayPal. Now, getting into the, uh, the video today. The video today, we will be refuting Rumsey. And if there is any Muslims that want to join in and then they want to defend Rumsey, uh, the link is in the description. Uh, so any Muslim that wants to jump up and defend their Muslim brother, argue, no problem. They're more than welcome to pop on up here and to see if they can hold up to scrutiny. So let me get on over here and let me extend this one out here a little bit. All right. So we have Mr. Rumsey's short. So we're going to listen to the short. We're going to hear his response to it. And then I'm going to give my response to his response. So let's see how good his response truly is. The challenge of the Quran is produce a book like it. Okay. Right? So I, I believe that Omar did it in Arabic. Yeah. He did it? Oh. Yeah. So he came up with three verses that uh, made it into the Quran. Yeah, Allah, please, after 1400 years of failure, you're trying to tell us that Umar ibn Khattab, the companion of the Prophet Muhammad, one of the most devout Muslims of the time, actually refuted the Quran and he himself didn't notice? Yeah, he said, he said that the Lord agreed with me three, in three ways. Yeah, miskeen, the challenge of the Quran is not say something that Allah agrees with so that Allah reveals verses agreeing with you. The challenge of the Quran is to produce verses like the Quran. Umar ibn Khattab didn't create verses like the Quran. He said something that Allah agreed with, so Allah revealed verses agreeing with him. I mean, seriously, after 14 centuries, this is what they come up with? Did you know? <laughs> That's right, people. Y'all heard it from the mouth of Ramsey. Those three verses, they weren't divinely inspired revelation. Allah heard Umar saying it, and he's like, you know what, Umar? You're right, man. I'm going to now send it down through Jibreel to Muhammad, and now he's going to say it. Now, see, the problem I see with this response from Rumsey is that there's, there's two problems, and, and we'll go over them slowly. So what they're quoting is in Sah Sahih al-Bakari uh, 4483, and it states, narrated by Anas, Umar said, I agreed with Allah in three things, or said, my Lord agreed with me in three things. Now, we know that it could it's the latter, of course. Allah agreed with Umar in three things. I said, O oh Allah's Messenger, oh, would that you took the station of Abraham as a place of prayer. I also said, O oh Allah's Messenger, good and bad persons visit you, and would that you ordered the mothers of the believers to cover themselves with veils. So the divine verses of Al Hijab, uh, the veiling of the woman, were revealed. I came to know that the prophet had blamed some of his wives, so I entered upon them and said, you should either stop troubling the prophet or else Allah will give his apostle better wives than you. So again, before Allah reveals this verse to Muhammad, Umar tells Allah, uh, Muhammad's wives, you, you can't do this because if you do, you know, Allah is going to get him better wives. 
Oh, Umar, does Allah's messenger, ha uh, says here, or else Allah will give his apostle better than you. When I came to one of his wives, she said to me, Oh, Umar, does Allah's messenger uh, haven't what he could advise his wives with that you tried to advise them? Thereupon Allah revealed. It may be if he divorced you, his Lord would give him instead of you wives better than you, Muslims. So what we see here is we see that in three different instances, Umar made a statement that Allah copied and then went into the Quran. The Quranic challenge is to produce a surah like it. Right? That, that, that's what the challenge is. To produce a surah like it. Umar produced an ayat so much like it that Allah took it and put it into the Quran. Challenge completed. Right there. As soon as Allah gave it the pass as being a, uh, a sa the same as the Quran because he took it and placed it into the Quran, he then confirmed that Umar did complete that challenge before the challenge was even offered. Now, the second problem that we see with this is that Rumsey actually admitted that his God borrowed from a companion, an all knowing God borrowed from his companion. And Rumsey actually thinks that this is a good answer. He actually says after 1400 years, this is all they have. So after 1400 years, this is the best answer you can provide is to say that your God stole the words of another man and, and imposed them as divine revelation of an all knowing God that always existed. Now, remember the Quran is in the mother of the book in heaven, correct? So if Rums if Rumsey was actually smart, right, he would have realized that there was already a Quran that existed in heaven long before Umar was born. Weirdly enough, Umar quoted three direct verses from that Quran that was in heaven before he even knew about it. You see how these problems keep getting worse for these Muslims? And all they see and all they simply do is they try to answer a question. Right? We see how bad that one ended up for you, Rumsey. Now, again, I'm not sure how long this live stream is going to go. We get somebody up here that wants to talk a little bit. Uh, it could go a little bit longer. If not, uh, it may be only about a 40, 45 minute uh, another video, uh, simply because we do have David Wood and our and our boy God Logic coming up at 8:30 tonight. So we need to be aware and awake and ready for that one. So I don't want everybody to be here and running over to that stream as well. Um, so yeah, let's get into this. So we can get this done and over with. The Quran was written 200 years after Muhammad. And yet here I was thinking it couldn't get any worse. For those who are unaware, the first physical mushaf was compiled during the lifetime of Abu Bakr anhu, who was, by the way, not 200 years old. I'm going to show you guys how Allah of the Quran. All right. So that's supposed to be a response. Um, so. The guy said that the manuscripts of the Quran are 200 years after the death of the prophet. And that's correct. The oldest Quran that they have is that old after Muhammad. It, it's not, it, it's not a, it, it's not like it's a, it's not like it's a, a secret, right? Those manuscripts exist. Like, like people can actually Google it and see it, right? So it, it's not like the guy lied. He, he didn't. Now, what Rumsey tried to do here is to go back into a hadith, which when were the hadith stated, everyone? 150 to 200 years after the prophet. So really, he's going to evidence that's dated to 150 to 200 years after the prophet died to produce evidence that this thing existed at the time of the prophet. 
Now, he says that uh, Abu Bakr or Umar collected a book and compiled a book, and that would have been the first Muslim. Okay, where is it? Where's that one from him? That's, that's what we want to see, right? Once he can provide that Mus'haf in totality from that time, then his claim can be established. But until then, he can't just make the claim without actually having any evidence. You notice Muslims like to do that, right? I call it taf at Tafsir al Trust Me, bro. That's all it is. Trust me. Trust me. We got it. Can I see it? No. No, we can't see it. But just trust me, bro. Just trust me. Uh, oh, we got the man, the myth, the legend. My brother from another mother. God bless your mother, though. God bless Mama God Logic. My boy Avery's in the house. God bless you, God Logic. We see you out at Balboa Park doing your thing. God bless uh, Bible and Quran out there if you're with him as well. God bless him as well. He does some wonderful work. Glad to have him out there on the front lines battling as he always does. Y'all keep it up. And while I'll be watching you tonight when you're with David Wood as well. Hey, I, I, need, a, I need a shout out tonight, my brother. We need a shout out tonight. No, I'm just joking. Love you, brother. Keep doing your thing, brother. Keep doing your thing. So God Logic says, yes, Rumsey should be a Muslim apologist. The more lies he spreads, the more opportunities we have to expose Islam. And ain't that the truth, God Logic? Ain't that the truth? Uh, so y'all keep God Logic in your prayers because he is out there fighting the battles. Uh, hopefully I can get out there next weekend and be fighting alongside you, dear brother. We'll get there. We'll get there. All right. Now, I, I like this argument, too. Let, let's get into this one. Iran is actually Satan. And here we go again. Yalla, what you got? One of the main things that Islam teaches is the denial of Jesus Christ's crucifixion. When we read Surah 4157, it says, And they're saying, Surely we have killed the Messiah, Isa, son of Miriam, the messenger of Allah. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. But it appeared to themselves, and most surely those who defer therein, are only in a doubt about it. So we learn in this passage here that Allah made it appear like Jesus was crucified and killed. We've been over this before. The verse says, Walakin shubbiha lahum, which means it was made to appear so. Nowhere does it say that Allah made it appear so. But I'll tell you what, let's just say for a second that Allah did make it appear to the enemies of Christ that Jesus was crucified. Now, if you have a problem with that, then in reality, you have a problem with the Bible because 2 Thessalonians tells us that God sends strong delusion for people to believe lies. Revelation that Muhammad... Yeah, so I'm not going to get into his gross misrepresentation of the Bible just as of yet. But did you all just hear what he said? Did y'all just hear what he said? He just done throw a lot under the bus. Now, if my big brother Scott was up in this house, he'd have some choice words for Mr. Rumsey. And, and, and since my big brother ain't up here right now, I could have done represent for him. We, we don't let nobody, there ain't no Muslim allowed to throw Allah, the Quran, or the scholars under the bus. Ain't gonna happen. Not no way, not no how. If Allah, or the Quran, or the, or the, the companions of Muhammad are going to be thrown under the bus, it's gonna be by me. That's right, by me. Not by them Muslims. I got you, Brother Scott. I got you. We ain't letting any Muslim throw a lot under the bus up in here. But you see what he just did? He just basically said that Allah isn't the one that made it appear like it was Christ that was on the cross. He literally said that. The, the first logical question, right? Well, who could it be? Who has the power to be able to make 
something happen in reality and have everybody that's there believe it, but it be a lie. In Rumsey's view, who has that power? Amen, R-N-O. He's an idiot. He's an idiot. Plain and simple. The man is right. It was a law who was the one, because if you continue reading what's going on, Allah is condemning the Jews for crucifying Christ, saying, no, you guys didn't do this. Y'all think you did, but y'all didn't do it. It was just made to appear to you that it happened. When it was made to appear to them that it happened, it had to be made to appear by Allah. That's how stupid Rumsey truly is. Truly. And all I did is I watched about four or five of his shorts today. And I was like, I got to do a video on it today. Like, this doesn't even make any sense. Like, he's actually putting these out there like these are good arguments. I, I, I don't know. Like, throwing a law under the bus and saying that Allah didn't do things that he definitely said that he did. I have no idea what's going on in his head. Right? So, yes, Allah is Satan. And thank you very much for the only way that you're going to deny that Allah is Satan is to say that Allah is not the one uh, that caused the Jews to believe that they crucified Jesus. That That's your only argument that you got. Awesome. Let's get to the next one. Revelation that Muhammad had 500 years after Jesus, which obviously means Muhammad never met Jesus. Do these missionaries think God has a bad memory? Since God doesn't forget, it wouldn't matter if he sends a prophet 500 years later, 600 years later, or 6 million years later. Uh, he kind of does forget. I think Rumsey is forgetting the concept of abrogation. Um, Allah forgot that he gave a, a, a worse verse. He's like, oh, no, I got to give another verse now. I got to abrogate that. So, you know, it, his God does forget. But let, let's continue. That that book, the Quran is a more accurate presentation of their historical Jesus than the Gospels written by the eyewitnesses. I guess this is just one of those things where if you say it enough times, people start to believe it. It's almost as if, if they just keep insisting that the four Gospels are authored by eyewitnesses to Jesus, that will just somehow magically believe it. You have neither any manuscripts of the New Testament from the first century, nor any authenticated, uninterrupted chain of transmission that goes back to Christ. Now, here's the thing. You might not believe the Quran is the word of God, but if you want to see it from a Muslim perspective, on the one hand, we got the word of God. On the other hand, we have anonymously authored, unverified sources telling us something different. Needless to say, the word of God takes precedence. I had... This is the one I've been waiting for. So Mr. Rumsey says that you need to have a chain of narration and is not for something to be true. Well, I would think that he has no idea what he's talking about because there's no way that historians use that as a criterion to be able to determine what is true and what is not true when it comes to history. But, oh, here we go. We got my thing up here now. Yeah, we do. Awesome. So let me just go ahead and we'll, boom, full screen that. We'll hide this. Boom. Tertullian of Carthage <coughs> says the Gospels written by Matthew and John, who were apostles, who would have been eyewitnesses, and Luke and Mark, who were apostolic men. Mark's Gospel is the record of Peter's preaching. Anybody see something here? We, we, we've got a... All right. Clement of Alexandria. Let's just keep going down in time, people. Let's just keep going down in time. You know, he, he says it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist, he says. Clement of Alexandria, who lived from around 150 to 215, wrote around 180, stating that uh, Mark wrote his gospel. Matthew and Luke were published first. So for all those people that say Matthew and Luke copied from Mark, I have an argument with that one. Also, John's gospel was the last one to appear. Hmm. That's two. Everybody count it. That's two. Two. 
Oh my God, we have more. Weird, eh? Irenaeus of Lyons, 130 to 202, identifies Matthew's gospel was the first one written. Again, more argument against the people to say Mark was first. Mark, a disciple of Peter, handed down in his gospel what Peter had preached. Handed down from an eyewitness what he had heard the eyewitness speak of. Luke, a companion of Paul, recorded in a book the gospel preached by him. Now, see, this is where, again, Muslims, Ramsey has just gave up this argument because he said that God doesn't forget. So that means if the people didn't walk with Christ, they're still able to speak truth because God doesn't forget. So therefore, when Muslims say that Paul never met Jesus, all we have to do is say, well, just go ask Rumsey. He's he already said, God, don't forget. So yeah, God revealed to Paul his mission and what to do. And recorded a book, gospel preached by him was Luke. What he recorded from Paul, of course. John, the disciple of the Lord, published a gospel. Oh my, we got more. The Matorian fragment, Matthew and Mark. Luke, the physician, and the companion of Paul wrote his gospel. John, who is an eyewitness, wrote his gospel. Whew. Oh, we got more. Justin Martyr, our great apologist, says Christians possess the memoirs of Jesus, which were called the gospels. These were written by apostles and by those who were their followers. Doesn't identify him by name. Uh, but identifies the apostles and those who are their followers were the ones that penned it out, not just anybody's. And my last piece of information comes from St. Papias of Herapolis. He lived from 60 to 130 AD. He actually sat at the feet of John the Apostle himself. He was Bishop of Herapolis. He was first to refer by the name to the name of the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. He wrote that Mark based his gospel on Peter's preaching, as we've heard all along. Now, I'm sure he would have attested to the authorship of John as well, since he was an apostle of John. So, <clears throat> Mr. Rumsey, we have what we call a chain of authorship. I've just presented from the third century all the way to the first century, different people who identify the actual writers of the gospel and who they are. My challenge for Rumsey now, since I presented the chain of transmission that we have, they believe in what's called an isnad. They believe that there's an isnad that goes all the way back to the prophet. I would like for them to, I would like for them to show us an isnad that goes all the way back to the prophet. That is the challenge. Just one. It's all they have to present. Just one is not that goes all the way back to the prophet. Now, I don't want to end it quite right there either. Let me get this up here. Do I got this other one? I do, I think. Bam. Oh, yes. I also want to post, put this one out there as well. Uh, because I think I, oh, let me go ahead and. Raise it up there like that. Then I think I can get it up here this time. Because there's one more thing that I do want to show as well. Right, there it is. Let me go ahead and make this a little bit bigger. And we'll hide this one more time. Let's just go all the way back to Ignatius of Antioch. 35 to 107 AD, people. Ignatius quotes from the Gospels of Matthew, Luke, and John. In most of the letters of Paul, including 2 Timothy, which is considered a late book at times. He also uses Acts, Hebrews, James, and 1 Peter. 
Now I may not have cited anything from Mark, 2 Peter, Thessalonians, Colossians, or 1 to 3 John. He may have known the book of Revelations, as he also makes reference in Smyrnans 3 to Revelations 1 7. Let's count them out here, people. One, two, three. That's out of the Gospels. The, 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 the Gospels, the first three Gospels, right? Or three of the four Gospels right there. Quoted by Ignatius. They had to exist for him to quote them. This isn't Umar over here. We don't quote it, and then all of a sudden God picks up on us like, oh, that's a good saying. We got to put that in our book. We don't have that over here. Clement of Rome. Clement of Rome is recognized by the Catholic Church as being the Bishop of Rome from 88 to 99, though some writers, even including me, believe he may have led the Roman Church during the, per the persecution under Nero shortly after 64 AD. Clement does not use as much of the New Testament as Ignatius, though he uses the Old Testament a great deal, including the Apocrypha books. He clearly uses Romans and Corinthians, which would be appropriate in a letter from Rome to Corinth. He also uses Acts, Titus, Hebrews, James, and 1st to 2nd Peter. Knows a few books that wasn't used by Ignatius, was used also by Clement of Rome to show you that even more books at that time existed. Come on, people. We've got the evidence. Where's this Muslim evidence, though? That's what I'm asking. Where's that Muslim evidence? Come on now. All right. Here we go. One way. May you please answer this question. Muslims like to bring how the New Testament has omitted verses because they've been added to use it as proof of the Bible has been tampered with. Uh, there has been verses that have been added in later. This is what we have textual criti criticism for. Weirdly enough that you brought this question up, thank you so much. I just want to, because a lot of people do talk about textual criticism. So let me just go ahead and address a little bit of textual criticism as well. Okay. Let me get that slide back up here again, just so everybody understands what's going on. Oh, look, 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 look what we got here. All right. So we got, we got the screen back up there again. Yeah, we do. All right. So there are different types of categories when we talk about variants in the New Testament. The first type of category would be not viable and not meaningful. The second category would be viable and not meaningful. Which means it's viable, but it doesn't mean anything to the text, right? The third one would be viable and meaningful, which means it is viable and it is meaningful to the text. So let's go through them. How many variants do we have in the New Testament? So for anyone who does not know, if never looked into this matter, the New Testament has roughly 400,000 variants in the different manuscripts. This is a number that people like to use to scare people, but numbers shouldn't be scary, and here's why. 99% of those variants do not matter. Now, I know some of you may be saying, what do you mean they do not matter? Here, let me explain. For the not viable nor meaningful variants, an example comes to mind. In Mark chapter 1, verse 2, there is a variant where some texts say the prophet and other texts say Isaiah the prophet. This is, a t uh, this is a variant because all of the manuscripts do not read word for word identically. Now, there are a lot more examples that I can go through, but for time, I'm just going to explain variants instead of addressing them all because, again, there are 400,000. Also, in the Greek, there's a thing called the immovable new. A movable new is the letter N. So, if in so as an example, if in one manuscript you read the word John, J-O-H-N, and in another manuscript, you see the same word, but spelled J-O-H-N-N. -N. This is a variant, even though it doesn't affect the text nor the meaning, it is still a variant. So therefore, anywhere that happened in the thousands of manuscripts, it's a variant. There is no way someone can claim because of this that a text has been corrupted and can't be trusted. So again, this part of the, the variants, 
they, they can't say is actual corruption of the text. This category of variants would actually cover 74% of all variants in the New Testament. Remember, 74% of all those 400,000 variants are covered within this simple explanation. <coughs> now, the not viable, uh, but meaningful. I think this is opposite. This is the meaning. Uh, this is a viable, but not meaningful. It should be. Uh, this is, it means that a variant that changes the word, uh, the example Mike Winger gives in First Thess Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, is we were gentle among you. Uh, the Greek word apeo means gentle, but in the late manuscript, we see the word hippoi among you. Now, this is going to where I'm going to address the question. Okay, so in a late manuscript, we see the word hippoi among you, which would translate to be we were horses among you. It is found once in a later manuscript, so we know it was a mistake. So variants like this equate to 25% of variants in the New Testament. So what does that leave? Yep, that's right, 1%. 1% 1 of 400,000 is 4,000. So in this 1% category of variants means that the variant is actual meaningful and viable, and we'll jump into that. But speaking in this terms, a lot of people will point to 1 John 5, 7 and say it's a later uh, edition in the 13th, 14th century. Well, it is. We don't have any manuscripts earlier than that. We have a few of the church fathers. You could make an argument that some of them may have quoted it early on. I don't make that argument, but I know some that do. Right. Um, I do not believe that 1 John 5, 7 is authentic to the original manuscripts, um, but I could be wrong on that. And I'm up for correction. Now, there's also the woman, the adulteress, the adulteress's woman. That is a complete different story. Um, I believe that we can make an argument, a very solid argument, that that is, in fact, uh, part of the original manuscripts. Uh, so those are the two main parts that Muslims will go to to try to say that these are added into the scripture. Therefore, it's corrupted. If you add something into the scriptures, you then corrupt the scriptures and therefore they cannot be trusted. In that argument that they use, all you have to do as a Christian is say, OK, well, let's take first John 5, 7 out of the Bible and let's take the adulterous woman out of the Bible. Well, let's just remove them for argument's sake and say that they don't exist. Do we still see the original Christian doctrine that the eternal son of God entered his own creation in the form of a servant, willingly went to the cross, died by crucifixion and raised on the third day? The answer is yes. Okay, Islam is still false. Right? So even if you just remove those two verses that they think corrupt the scriptures, it doesn't really corrupt anything. Right? They actually have to believe that the Bible is not the Injil for them to make any type of argument whatsoever. But just let me finish up here. Now, the viable and meaningful. In Romans chapter 8, verse 2, is one example where scholars aren't certain on the original reading paul writes for the law of the spirit for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in christ jesus from the law of sin of death some manuscripts however read me instead of you and to be honest this is the category that scholars do not know what word would have been in the original so saying that it still doesn't mean that we cannot trust it for salvation right even of those 4,000 er, uh, meaningful and viable variants, only 1,500 to 2,000 actually affect the text. So what textual critics like Dan Daniel Wallace, Bart Ehrman, uh, Bruce Metzger, and others admit is that none of those 4,000 variants affect any of the Christian core doctrine. So, uh, yes, we can admit to certain things. Um, being interpolations that would have been added in later in time, uh, but not all of them, of course. Uh, so, no, Muslims aren't correct on that at all, especially people like Rumsey. Rumsey's an idiot, as we've already seen. A few times, a few times we've already seen that. All right, so <clears throat> now that we got that question answered, let's jump back into this video. Oh yeah, Rumsey. We we want that. Uh, we 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 want that. Uh, it's not. 
It shouldn't take very long for them to post up that it's not, eh? I wouldn't think it would. So many dreams in my life. I know what dream is, and I know what real is. And this was far from any kind of dream that I can ever imagine. I'm just curious to know if it actually gave you an intellectual reason as to why Islam is false and Christianity is true. But I. So remember that, everyone. Whenever a Muslim says that they left Christianity and accepted Islam, they have to have an actual, real, theological, you know, a, a, a sound grounding reason to why they left. Not simply because they believe in one God. That, because that's all we ever hear, right? Well, I just don't believe the Trinity and I believe in the one God, so I become a Muslim. Like, come on, it's got to be better than that, right? As, as Rumsey just said, since he wants to discredit this man, he's got to discredit Muslims for the same reason. I scream. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu an la Muhammad Rasulullah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. I said it like eight times, screaming, and my soul told me, you're wrong, it's not true. Sounds cool and all, except it's missing the part where either Jesus or some kind of angel comes along. It's pitch black. All I see is this white, white light flying around me in circles fast, and I'm falling. I knew it was my guardian angel. Right on schedule, the angel shows up and tells you Christianity is true, eh? Um Almost like right on time when the angel showed up and choke slammed Muhammad and told him Islam was true. Amir, Amir, you have to listen to me. You have to tell him he can still hear you. Tell Jesus to save you before your soul leaves your body. You know what? You got me. Hey, excuse me, where's the... Amen, Amir. I am so glad that you uh, confessed to Jesus uh, before your soul does leave your body because every knee which is in heaven, which is on earth, and which is under the earth, it will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is their Lord. They can either do it in this life or they can do it in the next. But if they do it in the next and they don't do it in this life, it's going to be a real hot kneeling. They're going to be the ones underneath that are bowing at that point. The pool, I need to get baptized. Rob, question. If we find something in the Bible that's found in previous books, is that that's not a problem for the Bible? Not a problem. If we find the exact same thing identical for the Quran, is that a problem? Yes, it is. Now, he actually thought that this was a good argument. Now, the reason why is because the Quran is the direct, uh, direct speech of Allah through Jibreel to Muhammad, right? So if we find those same revelations in prior books, then we can say that it's not original to Muhammad and Allah, that it was something that was already known amongst the people at the time would separate it from being divinely inspired. On the other hand, we know that the Bible... Now, again, I may disagree with Rob a little bit here, but I think what Rob is actually saying, because I know Rob from Sentinel Apologetics, is that the Bible is addressing a certain group of people, a certain, a certain people. So it would draw from other material to make its point. But we don't believe that the Bible is direct dictation from God through an angel down to the prophet word for word. We, we believe that the prophets that God has provided have the ability to speak on their own through the power of the Spirit as well. That's something that Muslims don't believe in. So Jews and Christians believe prophets and God's revelation come to them in different ways, of course, or the same way, different way than what Muslims believe that God would send his revelation down to his prophets. That's why the books can't be compared the same way, which is why R Rumsey's so dumb and doesn't realize that the, what Rob actually said is true to what Rob actually believes, right? 
but of course, they, they didn't want to go through that. So I thought it was pretty funny, and I wanted to add that in here since uh, Rob from Central Apologetics is a good friend of mine. Was it, was a mistake that that passage a mistake? Well, I'm not saying. Well, I don't think it's original. So it would be a mistake then, right? Well, not the whole chapter, just that. But passage. just that, just that passage. about the woman caught in adultery. Yeah. Well, at least now we know this isn't some crazy Muslim conspiracy. Better late than never, but more and more Christian missionaries are starting to admit that the Bible they read contains mistakes. If it was added, and I think it was, it wasn't added like mischievously. Malash, no problem. I'm sure these people had great intentions, you know, adding things to the word of God, claiming it's the word of God, even though it wasn't actually the word of God. I wonder how many more non-mischievous mistakes we can find in the Bible. The challenge of the Quran is produce a book like it. Okay. Non-mischievous verses that we find in the Bible. Non-mischievous verses that we find in the Bible. Now, Muslims keep saying that the Quran is perfectly preserved from the time of Muhammad until now. Right? Let me just go up here a little bit. Hadith number 1050, the book of Zakat. I'm not going to read all this. But there they are. <coughs> says here, you are the best among the inhabitants of Basara, for you are the reciters among them. So continue to recite it. But bear in mind that your reciting for a long time may not harden your hearts as were hardened the hearts of those before you. We used to recite a surah which resembled in length and severity to Surat al Barat. I have, however, forgotten it, weirdly enough, with exception of this, I remember of it. If there were two valleys full of riches for the son of Adam, he would long for a third valley, and nothing would fill the stomach of the son of Adam but dust. And we used to recite a surah which resembled one of the surahs of the Mushabat. And I have forgotten it. But I remember this much of it. O oh, people who believe, why do you say that which you do not practice, and that is recorded in your necks as a witness against you, would be asked about it on the day of resurrection? Perfect preservation. Yet mischievously, we have Muslims removing 150 verses out of a surah. We actually have Ibn Masud's Quran and the Quran they have nowadays with two surahs that are missing. So how many more mischievous surahs and ayats have these Muslims removed or added to their Quran? We should just find out since Rumsey, since, since it's such a big deal. Oh, sorry. My bad, Protestant believer. You are correct. That's the one where over 300 verses were missing. Not just 150, 300 verses were missing. This is what we need to do, people. Come on now. Come on, Rumsey. You, you, are you okay with over 300 verses being just taken out? maliciously, viciously removed from your Quran. How do you know that that wasn't supposed to be there? Who gave him that permission to do that? Did Allah? Is this guy now the new prophet after Muhammad? Come on, Muslims, we need an answer here. You see how bad Muslims truly are when it comes to this. Like, I, I don't truly understand why Muslims can look at the Bible and be like, oh, my God, there was something added or something removed. Oh, my God, it's corrupted. But I'm going to look at my Quran and realize that over 300 verses were removed. Oh, no, that was by the will of Allah. That's OK. That, that doesn't mean corruption. Not at all. Not at all.
Salahab Al-Masid, Brother Daniel Alvarez, with the big 1999 Super Chat. Thank you so much for the support to ministry, dear brother. God bless you. Thank you. It says, keep up the good work, brother. God bless you and your family. God bless you as well, brother. God bless you as well. Um, hopefully, uh, I will be doing a couple more videos this week. Um, I'm going to try to get back into doing some response videos because I, I, I really enjoy doing that, getting these videos up, uh, looking through the Bible, looking through the Quran again. It actually got a little bit more, it, it gave me a little bit more pick me up, I guess you could say, uh, when I was going through the scriptures yet again, something that we should do constantly anyway. Uh, but that's going to get me ready for next weekend. I just want to announce to each and every one. Next weekend, I will be taking off. I'm going to be going up to Ottawa. Uh, they do have Muslims up in Ottawa that have opened up a tent. Uh, they are preaching Islam up there in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. I am not that far away, so I will be going up next weekend. I tried to go up this weekend, and I couldn't. Uh, but I will be going up next weekend uh, no matter what. Um, so, yeah, so if anybody wants to support the ministry with that type of thing, you can hit me up through the PayPal and or you can join the Patreon and help out the ministry. Uh, so please keep an eye out for the videos that I will be doing this week. Now, we all have about 30 minutes left. We, we got about 30 minutes left. I don't want to keep you all here. I need everybody to get up. I need you all stretch your legs, go grab a drink, maybe make a little bit of supper. And get ready because at 8.30, we got David Wood, we got the Dizzle, and we got Mr. God Logic, we got Averin. So we'll have Di the Dizzle and Averin live at 8.30. So y'all need to get ready for that. So I don't want to keep you up here too much. So within saying that, thank y'all so much for showing up on another, li another live stream. I'm not sure if I'll be live tomorrow or if it'll be Tuesday, but it will be one of those days. If y'all have the uh, bell turned on, y'all get the notifications. And with saying that, thank you so much for being here again with me for another live stream. God bless you and have a wonderful week at work. Hello everyone. My name is Chris Claus and I'm going forward with my plans for a full-time ministry. I've been praying about it for over two years now, and in the last week I've had some great ideas for my online ministry. So with that and the confirmation by dear sister Connie and brother God Logic, I believe it's time for me to start my online ministry, which I will not be able to do without you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. So what I will do is explain my intentions and what I plan on doing in my online ministry to glorify our Lord and Savior. First, I want to do some street evangelism. God Logic and Bible of Quran have really inspired me to put up a tent here in Canada, and I'll be going through different towns from Toronto to Ottawa and specifically talking to people on the street. I'll have more and better quality of videos with a little bit more professionalism in them as well. And I will be doing a live stream once a week, and I'll specifically go live for my members on Patreon and or YouTube. Here I'll, I will be able to interact with the community once a week, during which I will bring some people live as well. These are just some of the new ideas God has planted in my head to do. The apologetics army that David Wood was talking about will come to fulfillment. So let us as Christian soldiers support those on the front lines that do the battle with the spirit of hatred on a daily basis. To support me and my online ministry, please sign up as a Patreon. If I can get 500 Patreons, I can start my full-time ministry, and I know that it can happen by God placing it upon your hearts to support the ministry. May we always glorify our Lord and Savior.